Hello, everyone, and welcome to Building Retrofits for Small and Medium Enterprises, an EnviroCenter presentation. We'll be starting with part one, which is where to start. What is EnviroCenter? A few words about EnviroCenter. We are your friendly neighborhood, local, environmental nonprofit. Our mission is to provide people, communities, and organizations in Ottawa with practical solutions to lighten their environmental impact in lasting ways. And our work focuses on four main areas. That would be green homes, active transportation, which also includes mass transit, green lifestyles, and green businesses. Energy services is the department within EnviroCenter that deals with energy consumption in buildings and in homes. And within that division, we do home and multi-unit residential building energy audits. We do business energy analysis and audits, and we do business carbon accounting through Carbon 613. We also do green audits of various types. Carbon 613, a few more words about this program. It's a membership-based program for Ottawa businesses. Through Carbon 613, members gain access to events, resources, and discounts. It offers comprehensive tools for carbon analysis and target setting. And by joining Carbon 613, you join a local network of businesses committed to climate action. I am Greg Furlong, Senior Energy Analyst with EnviroCenter. I am an energy advisor. That is through Natural Resources Canada. I've been with them since 2003 as an energy advisor. Uh, the Canadian Home Builders Association Net Zero Homes Program. Uh, I am qualified to deliver that as well as Energy Star and R2000. I'm also a certified energy manager with the AEE. That is the Association of Energy Engineers. I have evaluated over 100 multi-unit residential buildings, plus about a dozen commercial audits of various kinds, mostly worship spaces. I'm, I also did about 700 private homes since 2003. And I lived in Toronto for about 16 years. And while I was there, I co-founded a successful re retail business that operates to this day. So. I have a bit of the, the small business background for, to share uh, that kind of insight with you. Our goals today, first of all, to understand energy and carbon trends for small businesses, to understand the specific benefits of energy retrofits, and to share success stories. So why energy efficiency? Well, if you look at buildings, there's a lot of waste. We're losing about 30% of the energy. You're losing 30% of your pie is going straight out the window. So obviously you would want to keep as much of your energy as you can and put it to good use in the building. Energy savings means less waste. It means smaller equipment and infrastructure needs. It also means lower peaks of energy use for those of us who are on peak billing. And that all amounts to dollar savings. It also adds up to less carbon dioxide production, so less GHGs. And with that comes lower pollution, cleaner air. So there are many benefits to be had from energy efficiency. Let's look at a bit of the bigger picture here. So in Canada, commercial efficiency is rising about 2.5% per year that amounts to about $420 million in savings nationally. On the other hand, energy use is still rising by about almost 2% per year. And that's because we have more enterprises and activities, there's growth happening. So even though we're becoming more efficient, there's more activity. And if we wanna get our carbon down, we're going to have to do something about that. The easiest way to drop carbon while maintaining growth is to reduce combustion because that's where most of the carbon comes from. 
and to switch to cleaner, efficient energy sources. In other words, to stop burning things. Now, if we look at the carbon content of various fuels or sources of energy, it varies quite a bit for the same amount of energy. And it turns out that in Ontario right now, natural gas produces 10 times the carbon of electricity. That's natural gas. And electricity, as you can see, is this tiny one to the right. Over to the left are fuel oil and propane, and somewhere off the chart is coal. Let's look at carbon pricing. This is something that's now coming up on over the horizon here in Canada. So in the European Union, they began in 2005. Now they're at 30 euros. That's about 44 bucks per ton of CO2. In Canada, we have now introduced $20 per ton in 2019, but it's rising by $10 every year to $50 by 2022. So that's going to have an impact on anything that produces carbon. As a result, the cost of electricity is only rising 1%, but gas will go up 34% by 2022. So it's going to have an impact on the way that we use energy. So getting back to efficiency, it's going to help lower your carbon fees, especially if you switch to electricity from other fuel sources. Let's look at net zero targets. We're hearing a lot about this term net zero. What does it mean? Net zero energy means your consumption equals your generation on site. Net zero carbon is somewhat similar. You want to reduce your energy use as much as possible. But we're, for any remaining carbon, it's going to be offset in some way. Now, the federal government here in Canada is currently aiming at 30% below 2005 levels by 2030. That's the logo at the right. Federal government and the city of Ottawa are saying they're going to reach net zero carbon by 2050 in 30 years' time. By comparison, the city of Copenhagen, they're aiming to reach net zero carbon by 2025. Now, how can they say that? Well, they've already reduced their emissions by 42% since 2005, so they know they're on track. And uh, so we have a bit of catching up to do to, uh, to catch up to places like uh, Copenhagen. How is this going to affect your business? So, first of all, half of small Canadian businesses are in Ontario. And here's the breakdown for energy use on an average basis. It shows that our heating and cooling account for more than 50% of our energy use. It's 42% for space heating, 43%, and for space cooling, 9%. Auxiliary equipment is about 22%. That includes refrigeration, cooking, machinery, computers, office equipment, etc. The kind of equipment that you use to actually do your business. And note that lighting only constitutes 10% of energy use typically. So energy savings can add up to operating cost savings. So it's not, it's going to benefit your bottom line if you aim for energy efficiency. Let's look at some upgrades with impact. So first of all, building envelope, as we term it, that is the outside edge of your building, the, the part that separates you, the interior from the exterior. If you can improve that, you can lower your heating load, you can lower your carbon footprint, and you can lower your operating costs. HVAC upgrades, that's heating, ventilating, and air conditioning upgrades can also have a big impact, but you need to look at both the dollar and the carbon savings. And also avoid committing to combustion. As you can see, the, co the cost of carbon is going up, so we maybe don't necessarily want to put all our eggs in that basket. Let's look at some kinds of retrofits. 
lighting retrofits? Well, if you're going to put in lighting, the answer is LEDs these days. Lighting retrofits can lower your operating costs because electricity is expensive. It's roughly four times the cost of natural gas per unit of energy right now. But if you do upgrade your lighting, you will only get very small energy or carbon savings because your lighting is only 10% of your total and your heating load will go up. Why? Because your older lighting was producing more heat and now your gas furnace needs to work harder to produce the heat to make up for that, that that's lost from that lighting. So if you heat with natural gas, your carbon costs and footprint will also rise if you do electrical upgrades in general. If you're heading towards net zero, here's some ways to approach that. So first of all, look at solar energy. You're going to need to have generation on site. Look at your rooftop or nearby available property and assess it for solar production. There are several companies in Ottawa that do this kind of thing. Get an energy audit. That will help you identify what upgrades would be appropriate and the sizing of the equipment, also the sizing of the solar array, and also the costs and benefits that can be realized through these kinds of upgrades. And with that information, you can create your energy plan to lower your energy use to match your solar production. And that would be how you would reach net zero. Let's look at some other benefits of efficiency to your business. First of all, we're going to start by looking at utility rates since they can vary and may, maybe need a bit of explaining. So with natural gas, rate six, which is your typical commercial rate here, for smaller users anyway, it comes to about 35 cents per cubic meter. That will be the price as of April 1st of this year when we go up to about $30 per ton of carbon. But you're also paying $985 a year in fixed costs, which uh, turns out to be important for smaller users. If we look at electricity, if your demand is less than 50 kilowatts, you're charged on a very similar basis to the average private home, which is 14 cents per kilowatt hour. That would be your mid-peak rate. And with a $270 per year fixed rate. By the way, these include taxes, these, uh, these rates. If your demand is greater than 50 kilowatts, if it's between 50 and 1500, then you get potentially cheaper rates on average uh, for kilowatt hours for buying your electricity. But you have to pay demand charges. Right now it's 1130 per kilowatt demand. And your demand may be a bigger concern than your consumption. So that changes the dynamic of, the, of making energy upgrades. So you may be more interested in, in reducing your, your peak your peak uh, usage. And yes, yeah, you can see the fixed costs are much higher. It's about 10 times as much uh, per year. So if you can reduce your demand less than 50 kilowatts, that would be ideal. Then you get into paying much lower rates, depending on the size of your business that may or may not be possible. Let's look at, now that we've looked at the fuel, at the fuel costs, the, the energy costs, let's look at our building envelope improvements. If you were to do upgrades that got you 20% savings on a $15,000 a year heating bill, that would amount to about $3,000 per year. So the net present value of that is $26,000 if, if we say it's 3% over 10 years, plus added property value. That means that you could spend... If you're going to, if you intend to own that property for 10 years, you could spend $26,000 on getting that, that, uh, savings. So it, it would probably be worth it. If we're looking at a 60% reduction in our energy use, that would now earn us $9,000 a year in savings with a much higher net present value of 77,000. However, 
your capital costs are going to be a lot higher. They might well be over $100,000. So it might not be worth it. We'll look at this a bit later on. Equipment, you can reduce your carbon costs and footprint by 70 to 90% if you replace your air conditioning with heat pump technology. You get very similar operating costs if you keep your existing heating system. There are very small incremental costs. By incremental costs, I mean the additional cost of going to a heat pump rather than just putting in an, um, another air conditioner. And you get cooling out of it because heat pumps work both ways. We'll talk a bit more about heat pump technology later for those of you who do not understand that kind of technology. Solar panels. These are an interesting factor, a new factor in our energy picture. So here in Ottawa, about 2,000 square feet produces roughly 40,000 kilowatt hours yearly, which amounts to about almost, just over $5,500 a year in, in terms of um, kilowatt hour value. So the net present value of that is $48,000 with the same terms as we discussed on the previous slide. So that means that you could, you could afford to spend $48,000 on that, and they, and they cost quite a bit less than that. They have no moving parts, and they've got a 25-year warranty. So they are definitely worth serious consideration if you're planning to stay in that building for a while. What other things are energy efficiency going to do for you? You're going to get more uniform heat and air conditioning. You're going to get less air movement, better ventilation. You'll get better humidity control, and you'll get fewer complaints from your tenants or your employees. These are all very worthwhile added benefits. Another factor would be reduced maintenance. If you have smaller equipment requirements, you may be able to get rid of some kinds of equipment. If you have heat pumps, you have fewer pieces of equipment to maintain. In other words, to start with, you may have had a furnace and an air conditioner. Afterwards, you may just have the heat pump. So it simplifies your maintenance. Also, if you're doing building envelopes, uh, if you're doing building envelope upgrades, such as attic uh, upgrades, air sealing and insulation in the attic, for example, you would have less maintenance and your roof would last longer, potentially, because you have less ice buildup. Another benefit of the energy efficiency gains, as discussed earlier, is reduced CO2 emissions. As we discussed earlier, lighting and electricity upgrades have a small impact. Upgrading to similar HVAC equipment, in other words, taking your boiler, for example, and just putting in a more efficient boiler, has a medium impact, between 5 and 30%. If you do envelope upgrades, they can vary quite a bit, but let's say you can have pretty much a medium impact, between 5 and 40%. Upgrading to heat pumps, however, has a big impact. It can impact your CO2 emissions by between 50 and 95% because you're switching off of combustion. And don't forget that the carbon pricing means added dollar value on any emissions reductions over time. So we also have marketing adva advantages. For example, IKEA, here's a quote from their founder, Ingvar Kamprad. He says, no method is more effective than the good example. And a, a couple of, of areas on their website include save money on the planet without leaving your home and top tips for sustainable living. So this is the kind of thing that they're using to get more, more people in the store. Mountain Equipment Co-op has public statements on sustainability, including their carbon footprint. They proudly, on their website, have any kinds of awards that they have. For example, they were named Canada's most trusted brand by the Gustafson's Brand Index and selected as one of Canada's top employers and greenest employers by MediaCorp. So these marketing initiatives are worth something as well. So let's look at incentives and support. There are some incentives available. Prescriptive or performance. Prescriptive means that you will get an incentive based on what you, on the equipment or the upgrade that you put installed. 
that you installed in your business. If they're performance incentives, you're going to be rewarded based on how much better your business operates after those upgrades were, are, are installed. For example, through Hydro Ottawa, we have Save on Energy. Enbridge has a smart savings program. There's also financial support for industry through Natural Resources Canada. There's the ISO 50001 standard. And there's a, a tax provision for clean energy equipment. So something your accountant can look into, perhaps. Let's look at some of the technology. Some of this is pretty basic, but it's good to, to discuss it. For example, insulation. A lot of people don't understand that insulation doesn't necessarily keep air from moving. It's a very poor conductor of heat due to trapped air within the fibers or within the within the insulation somehow, the, little, the pockets of air within that insulation. It is installed between inside and outside, obviously, but it's not necessarily airtight. So if you put in loose insulation, that it would be like fibrous stuffing uh, that's packed or blown, like cellulose insulation, um, or bats, they're not necessarily airtight. They're fibrous. Boards, on the other hand, can be somewhat airtight. Boards uh, are sheets of stiff material that are fastened somehow to the building. And we also have foam. So we have expanding foam. So you spray this onto a surface and it expands and hardens. And that can also act as an air barrier in some way. So it depends on the kind of insulation that you use, the effect that will have on the air tightness of your building. Heat exchangers. This is a, an idea that someone had that you can get heat from one stream into another without having those streams touch each other. So you transfer heat energy from one flow to another flow. And this concept is the basis of HRVs, ERVs, and drain water heat recovery. It's also used in furnaces, boilers, and automobiles. The radiator in your car is a heat exchanger, for example. It's taking the heat out of your engine and it's putting it into the air. Now, getting back to HRVs and ERVs, they take heat from the exhaust air and they put it into your fresh air coming into the building and they recover about 75% of the, of the heat. So they're actually pretty efficient. If you have a drain water heat recovery unit, they're up to about 60% efficient. They do a similar thing. They take the heat from your drain water and they put it into your inlet water that's heading into your water heater. Now let's look at heat pumps. What are these? The pump refers to how they can pump energy from one place to another. In other words, they're not just converting energy like a baseboard heater would. They're actually taking energy from one place and they're moving it to another. And they're Actually, you could consider them as an air conditioner that can run backwards in the winter. They provide both heating and cooling. They consume very little energy compared to natural gas, for example. 50% of the energy and 95% less CO2. Uh, those are pretty good numbers. The operating costs are now similar. And they're effective in colder climates like Ottawa. They weren't previously. When they were first introduced into Canada, they were, it was technology that was used in the U.S. and in the southern U.S. So they couldn't handle the very cold temperatures that we have here. But the newer models can. So we're looking at COPs, that is a coefficient of performance of 1.5 to 3.5 for air source heat pumps. What that means is that 1.5 to 3.5 times the energy in is what you get out of them. And they cost roughly about $10,000. On the other hand, you may be aware of ground or water source heat pumps. A lot of people think that these are the, the main kind of heat pump, but they're actually quite a bit rarer than air source heat pumps. 
what they do is they, instead of taking the energy out of the air, they take it out of the ground or water that's nearby. They have higher coefficients of performance, but their costs are also quite a bit higher. We were looking at two to three times the cost for the installation. Some words about electric heat, myth busting. So first of all, is electric heating inefficient? Because people will say that. Well, it may be costly, but it's not inefficient. It is at least 100%. That would be your baseboard heaters, your electric furnace, and so on. All of the energy that you have purchased stays in the house. There's no chimney. With heat pumps, you're getting 200 to 400%. That has to do with the COP that I talked about. So you're getting twice as much energy out of it, at least, as what you put into it. Is electric heat more expensive than natural gas? Well, this depends. So if you were going to close your rate six gas account, remember there was $985 you were paying on a fixed basis just to keep that gas account open. If you're closing it, then your resistance heat, this would be, let's say you put baseboard heaters in, they will only cost more if your bill, your gas bill is presently over $1,300 per year. For heat pumps, because they're so much more efficient, the number goes up. If your present gas bill is over $2,700 per year, then it is no longer worthwhile from a financial perspective to put in the heat pump. So I think a lot of businesses actually would fall into that category. A lot of small businesses would be below $2,700 a year. So it's certainly something worth looking at, even just from a financial perspective, if you're going to close that gas account. There are the two bars that are equal at that, at that rate. That was 175 gigajoules of heating fuel. And that's based on the, the carbon costs that are coming up in April 2020. So first steps. The first step here is, where am I? Benchmarking. So when you're doing bookkeeping, it's more than just dollars that you should be doing. You want to also do bookkeeping that allows you to make decisions based on the whole consumption picture. So you want to gather the, the data that accounts for kilowatt hours of electricity, meters cubed of natural gas, liters of oil, meters cubed of water, tons of CO2. So all of these other factors you want to be able to track as well as just dollars. You can do it yourself or you can get help. There is Energy Star Portfolio Manager. It's Canada's only standard benchmarking tool based on national statistically valid data. And it's an online tool and it's free. So that would be something you could participate in and will help you establish your baseline. See where you're starting from. You can also join Carbon 613. We will help you establish your, your baseline and will help you set your targets. Or you can get an energy audit. So energy auditing, when you get a standard commercial energy audit and like an ASHRAE level two, it will look at benchmarking. It will also look at all your equipment and your building envelope and we'll do utility and cost analysis and identify your upgrades, costs, and benefits. To find an evaluator, if you have an office, retail, restaurant, or workshop space, you would use an energy auditor or an energy manager. So typically these would be from consulting engineers, utility companies, and Vari is a, a local company that delivers lots of energy audits, but usually for larger corporations. If you have rental properties, on the other hand, if they are part nine, as smaller buildings, you can get an audit from a registered energy advisor who is registered through Enercan. We, EnviroCenter, has such people on staff. So contact us if you're interested in going that route. What do you get out of the process? You get an expert third-party analysis of your current situation. You get recommendations from someone who has experience in the area. You can see the benefits and costs of upgrades and the clear path to getting the work done. You also get a guide to the available incentives. So let's look a little bit at the incentives in a little bit more detail. You have the utility-based incentives from the ISO. 
So the CA1 Energy Retrofit Program, is it only deals with electrical savings. Enbridge, smart savings for commercial buildings, the home efficiency rebate, and there are also some other programs that they offer. On the federal level, there is, as I mentioned earlier, the ISO 50001 standard. Participating companies have improved their energy performance on average by about 10%, and Enercan offers up to 50% of eligible project costs for that kind of upgrade. There is also the federal tra tax provision, as mentioned earlier, allows you to fully expense your solar energy system and heat recovery equipment and gives you a capital cost allowance rate of 100%. So talk to your financial people, your accountant, about this if you're thinking of going that route. If you rent, lease, or share, you may be wondering what you can do since you have limited control over the building. Well, first of all, you can influence your workplace. You can have a green team. You can reduce your energy use through behavior. Some, some small upgrades that you could do will have a big impact, especially those relating to how you operate the building, if you have control over that. You can also join Carbon 613 for ongoing support. You can also work on your landlord. The landlord's utility share may motivate them to make improvements. Those improvements also add value to the building, so that's another incentive from the landlord side to, to do these kinds of, make these kinds of changes. You get better tenant retention. But what I would suggest is if you were planning to go this route and you wanted to get your landlord on side for some specific energy upgrades, bring it up at the time that you're renegotiating your lease. You can also tell them about these workshops and about EnviroCenter and its activities. We can certainly help them if they're, if they're interested in heading in that direction. So building a plan. What do you want? You have to determine your upgrade goals, your efficiency and carbon upgrades, accept advice from these third-party experts, and work within your plan and budget. Who will build the plan? Well, you would work with the energy auditor to build the plan. The energy auditor will also assist with sourcing contractors and applying for incentives. First of all, we'll look at the stepped plan which would be best for ensuring cash flow if you're on a very tight budget. In that case, you would implement the cost-effective upgrades first. You would use savings to finance the further upgrades, and you would use incremental costs if equipment is due for replacement anyway. So to estimate how much things are going to cost you, you really shouldn't, If let's say you're, you have an old air conditioner, you don't want to say, yes, a new air conditioner is going to cost me $10,000, you want to figure out how much more is the best equipment going to cost me because you were going to have to replace that equipment anyway. This is one way of doing things. It isn't necessarily the way I would recommend. We'll look at it in the next slide to see about what you can do to have more impact. Now, this kind of scenario gives you more front-loaded costs because you're putting in some of the more pricey items to begin with, but you get greater savings in all respects. So you would implement the equipment upgrades first, like the solar photovoltaic cells, and put in heat pumps. And then afterwards, you would renovate the building to match the design capacity of the equipment that you installed. It's the same capital cost for both approaches, but there are substantial savings from going this route. For example, if this happened over a five-year period, you would stand to earn an extra $10,000 in money because you've installed the solar system early on and it started earning for you right away. Finding the right contractors. So try look for contractors you can trust and are comfortable with. Ask lots of questions, talk with previous customers, you can get referrals, or visit their past or current projects. These days, a lot of these companies have their projects online. They list them online. You can go and, and see them without even talking to someone. When you do find the right contractor, make sure you get a detailed written contract. But don't expect problem-free upgrades. There are always hidden situations. 
Some advice from the CHBA, the Canadian Home Builders Association, which would be along the same lines. First of all, know what you want, have a realistic budget, plan for the long term. Sequencing avoids having to redo. That is, uh, let's say you were building a wall and you need to do so, so something within that wall. Make sure you do the things within that wall before you build it, for example. Protect yourself by having a written agreement. Don't compromise on quality. Don't choose contractors on price alone. Beware direct sales. So that's some advice from the CHBA. Let's look at green tools and certifications. First of all, there's a bit of a range available here. Natural Resources Canada has data analysis software and modeling tools, including HOT2000, RETScreen, CanQuest, and Heat Pump pre-screening tool. And the best thing is that these are all available free. And uh, here's the link which uh, we can make available to you. The Canadian Green Building Council has certifications. It has the zero carbon building standard, and it also has LEED. So you can have a look at their site and see what they have to offer. By the way, we're going to go into this in more detail in part two. Passive House Canada. They do Passive House and Enerfit, PHI. The Canadian Home Builders Association has the Net Zero Home Labeling Program, which is sort of two stages. There's Net Zero Ready and there's Net Zero. And EnviroCenter actually delivers that program. So you can talk to us directly about it for more details. Or you can visit their website. Once again, more about that in part two. So easy energy efficiency upgrades. We'll cover the more difficult ones in part two. If you have poorly insulated ceilings, that can be an easy and effective energy upgrade. So we've got an instance here where you can see all the icicles forming. That would be very characteristic of a poorly insulated and air-sealed attic. So it could reduce your heating bill by about 10%. Now, that will depend. That will depend on whether you have a, an attic that has very little insulation in it to start with. So with attics, you air seal first based on blower door and infrared testing. Then you insulate. And I would recommend using blown cellulose if at all possible because it's such a great material. It's recycled. It has a very high R value. It's easy to install. It's economical. If you have a flat roof or a cathedral ceiling, that is a different situation. It requires a custom approach based on your particular situation, and I would recommend that you have third-party assessment by uh, someone who knows about these things, such as an energy advisor or an energy auditor. Added benefits from upgrading your attic are smaller icicles, reduced leaks, and lower maintenance costs. Going on to uncontrolled air leakage. Here is a commercial assessment that we did of a space. The photograph at the left shows a commercial door. It's large enough to drive a truck through. On the right-hand side, we can see the infrared images, and that, and that was while the building was depressurized. The dark areas show where the air leaks are, which are at the perimeter of the door. We can get reductions of 10% or more, depending on the situation. Air leakage testing will tell you where and how much, and Fire Center can help you out there. You would want to air sail the gaps, cracks, and openings, and weather stripping. You would want to do, um, in this case, they would want to upgrade their weather stripping. Added benefits, comfort, obviously, humidity control. If your building is really leaky, it tends to be really dry in the winter because our outside air is dry and we're bringing that in all the time. So the building will not be as dry if you're more airtight. Also health and safety. If you have an attached garage, for example, you're not gonna be drawing air in from that. Or if you have typically idling vehicles in your laneway, you won't be drawing air, exhaust air in from those areas. 
Another good area to target is any equipment that produces heat or cold. These are all the these are typically the kinds of equipment that use the most energy in your business. Lots of energy use equals lots of opportunity for savings. So if you have furnaces or boilers, upgrade. You can upgrade them. Or you might want to, instead of upgrading them at, at, the, at this point, at least make sure they're running properly until you've got your energy plan figured out. Air conditioners. I strongly recommend that you upgrade them to heat pumps. It's a very similar piece of equipment, but it will give you lots of added value, especially in these times. Makeup air. So if you have uh, a building where you have makeup air coming in and it needs to be preheated, and then you also have exhaust air, you would want to capture the air, the energy from your exhaust air and use that to preheat your makeup air rather than heating it directly. Water heaters. If you are in a typical business that doesn't use showers, you can upgrade to point of use. It's very small water heaters that reside close to where you need to use the water. You can also add heat recovery if you have showers. So that would be the drain water heat recovery. For refrigerators and freezers, refrigeration equipment, you would always want to be looking at upgrading those, making sure that they're running properly and upgrading them to the best you can when the time comes. Dryers and ovens, upgrade, add heat recovery. So you may be able to capture some of that heat and use it for other things in the building, or maybe even sell it to your neighbor. We'll talk about that in part two. If you have idling or redundant equipment, now you may recognize the unit in the photograph. It's a, uh, it's a wall cabinet heater that's used to heat a vestibule. And uh, these are typically about 4,000 watts. So anything that is running continually, turn it off, turn it down, or use timers. So phantom loads, if you have transformers, idling office equipment, you would want to turn those off if you, if you can. Although these days, modern transformers use a lot less energy than they used to. So it's, it's not necessarily as, as big an opportunity as it used to be. Any motors that run continuously should be on timers if they're not needed 24-7. Uh, HVAC systems after office hours can be turned down or turned off. Electric heaters for unused spaces. We see baseboard heaters down in the crawl space that are never turned off. They may be thousands of watts. That uh, where you can you can really make big savings by turning those off. As I mentioned, the cabinet heaters for entryways, turn them off, turn them down, put them on a timer. And for cost savings only, think about shifting the use to off-peak hours. For some kinds of equipment, you can have it run only or principally in the off-peak hours when the electricity is cheaper. You're not going to necessarily save energy, but you will save on your costs. And uh, all it takes is investing in a timer. Heat recovery from exhaust air. We mentioned this already with the makeup air. So you're going to capture up to 75% from the exhaust. With an HRV, heat recovery ventilator, you get your fresh air preheated for free. The ERV will do it and also provide humidity regulation. They have low electrical consumption, but they do need regular cleaning maintenance. Typically, they have to be cleaned quarterly. There's, there are filters, and then the, the heat exchanger, which is that diamond-shaped object in the middle, needs to be washed about once a year. There are commercial and residential models available. Here's the heat recovery from drain water. Now, this won't affect most businesses, but if you do have a rental property, it certainly would apply or could apply. First of all, you need to have a vertical drain from your shower, and uh, you wrap this piece of copper pipe around it. So the beauty of them is they have no moving parts and no maintenance, and they're installed by a plumber. There's no, they don't require any sensors or anything like that. Your water coming into the water heater is preheated for free. 
So when you factor in everything else, they can reduce your overall energy use by about 5%. So I have here a business retrofit video that I'd like to share with you. The Fisherman's Picnic is a local general store in Lunenburg, Nova Scotia. My daughter and I take care of the store. The picnic sells local products from small producers and local farmers and suppliers. In partnering with Efficiency Nova Scotia for the store, we were looking to get advice on products that would help reduce our electricity costs, especially over the winter. In dealing with the advisor, we installed a heat pump and also an energy efficient fridge and freezer. Since we installed the heat pump, we've been able to leave our fruits and vegetables out overnight with the cooling function on. We've never had to use the electric baseboard heating in the store, so that has reduced our overall costs. Then it makes the store a lot more comfortable. The process was easy. The paperwork I was dreading, and it was actually very simple and straightforward. Also, the speed in which they processed the rebate was really appreciated. <laughs> It's cool in the summer, it's warm in the winter, and definitely recommend the process. Now, returning to our presentation, we're going to briefly look at deeper energy efficiency upgrades. As I had suggested earlier, we're going to look at more details in part two, but here's a list. So if you have empty wall cavities, you can be thinking about filling them with cellulose. That could save up to about 20% on your heating. If you are thinking about adding exterior wall insulation, let's say you have a masonry structure or some kind of a structure that where you cannot fill the cavities, but it has no insulation, you can once again get about 20% reduction on your heating. But it's more expensive because you're going to have to clad the building and you're going to have to add uh, other layers. Foundation. You can get savings of up to 20% for interior or exterior insulation. It can be cost effective, but it requires expert advice in advance. Windows. They're not usually cost effective in terms of energy savings, but there's increased property value and they do increase comfort locally in the building. So they may be worth it. Also, they just wear out over time. So they may be due for replacement anyway. Solar energy, big capital cost, but as I mentioned, there's high returns. If you have net metering, you can offset your entire electricity usage each year. If your solar array is large enough and your energy needs are small enough. A site assessment is necessary. There's no guarantee that you are in a place where you're going to have enough area or you have enough sun uh, that it's going to be able to provide the, the kilowatt hours that you're looking for. Here's some business retrofit examples. First of all, looking at IKEA, they have set a global target of net zero by 2030. They have a commitment to energy conservation, including their supply network. There are solar panels on every roof. In fact, these panels in the picture are on top of their roof here uh, of, the, of their IKEA store here in Ottawa. They are also getting summertime peak, peak reductions for electricity because it's a large store. For sure, they are on kilowatt billing. So they're going to be reducing their peaks and they're going to be seeing big savings just by having those solar panels offsetting their electricity use on, on the warmest, those hot days in the, in the summer. Lots of sun and lots of air conditioning load. Here's a retrofit that was done at Humber College in Toronto. In the three pictures, we can see from left to right how it was upgraded. The whole building changed its, its entire appearance. But in the process, they have a building now that consumes 70% less energy than where they started from. So it's only 30% of the consumption of the original. This was the first retrofit project to achieve the zero carbon building design certification 
from the Canadian Green Building Council. And the project was guided by Humber College's 20-year integrated energy master plan. So they do have a plan, and this is one of their, their prime projects to show that indeed it can be done. Just wanted to talk about cogeneration briefly. We will talk about this more in part two, but right here in Ottawa is the Robert O. Pickard Environmental Center. That is actually where the wastewater is treated. It's a wastewater treatment plant. So at present, they're getting about 50% cogeneration from wastewater methane. So it's the methane that results from the process, and they're burning that, and they're using it to generate electricity and to run the facility. So it's, it's actually contributing about 50% of the energy. But they just announced in the fall that they're going to be upgrading that system, and it's going to be 100% cogeneration by 2024. They're going to upgrade their equipment, they're going to capture more methane, and they're going to be able to run, essentially, off the grid. Here's the Oakwood Design Center. Oakwood is a business that helps people do upgrades to their homes. So they are all about retrofits, and they have retrofits planned to achieve complete energy self-sufficiency and they have now installed the photovoltaic cells on their building. So I want to thank you for your participation today. Please don't miss part two of this series, From Plan to Project. And in that, we will talk about how to reach net zero, more details on upgrades, especially those that are a bit deeper, more about benefits and costs, more about available incentives, and more about getting support and we'll also have a couple of great examples in that presentation as well to share with you. Thank you, and bye for now.